Good morning, Ageless Believers. I hope that y'all are having a good week. I, I pray that y'all are staying healthy. COVID is actually on the rise, so be careful. Do not leave without your mask. Don't don't go shopping with, with without your mask on. I love you guys. Um, I, I pray for our country. Uh, this racial division that we have going on, it, it needs to end. It needs to stop. We need to look at, ye- look at each other as brothers and sisters and love each other. See each other like Jesus sees us. And that goes beyond the skin layer. I have a, a special prayer request for this week. Um, I have a special relative that, that needs your prayers. And I uh, just just ask for prayer for him and his family. He knows who he is. Um, I want to wish Barbara a happy birthday. I saw that on Facebook, uh, that it was her birthday this week. So I hope that you had a wonderful birthday, Barbara. Sorry I didn't get a chance to uh, talk to you, but, but I was thinking about you on your birthday. I didn't know that yours and Stephanie's birthday was, was so close. Uh, let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for this class. Dear Father, we love you. We want to be closer to you, Father. Dear Father, be with the ones that are sick, the ones that have COVID, the ones that are dealing with other illnesses, Father, cancer. Be with them. Be the be with the ones that are having family issues, dear Father. Put a hand of healing and, and comfort on families. Father, be with the president in our governor, in our country, Father. Dear Father, uh, I see more division than we've ever had in our country. Heal us. Heal the United States of America, Father. Dear Father, we love you, and we want to do what's pleasing in your sight. In your name we ask it. Amen. Okay, it is June 28th. I don't know if y'all were at church this morning. I hope that if if you were, I got a chance to see you. I know I was working words this morning. Um, Stop by. Say hello. Um, Last Sunday, I was was directing, so I was in that little little room beside the the sanctuary. So you you might not have seen me then. So uh, today's lesson is on Jesus healing a man born blind. Color blindness is a condition that limits the range of color that some people see. You know anybody that is colorblind? Reds and greens may be indistinguishable, for example, or purples may appear only as blue. Some colorblind people may not be able to see up to 90% of the various shades of color, resulting in a perspective dominated by browns and blacks. But recently... Technology has been developed to help most colorblind people see a fuller range of the color spectrum. You, you've probably seen some videos of people who put on these sunglasses for the first time. They're able to see color, and, and it's amazing reaction that they have. This tech has come in the form of, of special sunglasses. And people have been sharing their videos of trying these glasses on for the first time. The depth of color that these people can now see is matched, it seems, by the depth of emotion that soon colors their faces. Watching people see a wider array of colors for the first time is moving in part because they did not even know what they were missing. But on an even greater scale, the world is full of people living in darkness, the spiritual darkness of sin, and they don't even know it. What's more, they don't know know that there's a cure for their spiritual blindness. So today, we'll follow the story of Jesus healing a man who was born blind. This this miracle would reveal Jesus' identity to those able and willing to see it, that he is the light of the world to push back the darkness of sin. And Jesus is the Son of God who came to do the works of his Father, But those who chose to remain in their pride can't see Jesus for who he is, so they remain in their spiritual blindness and in need of hearing the gospel. So the first point of today's lesson is Jesus came to be the light in the darkness. 
Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Go, wash in the pool of Siloam. Which is translated, sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. In Jesus' day, and somewhat in ours, the thought prevailed that all suffering was the punishment of someone's sin. So the disciples wanted to know who messed up. Had the man sinned in his mama's womb? Or did his parents sin so that he was born blind? In a general sense, the disciples weren't wrong for thinking this way. All brokenness and suffering in the world is certainly a result of sin, and sin always has consequences. But people had extended this principle way too far. A specific sin had not caused this blindness, but its purpose was about to come to fruition. The prevailing thought of the disciples goes this way, and and see if you've ever thought something like this. If you obey God, you earn blessing. And if something bad happens to you, then you must have done something bad to earn it. Let's look at some more examples. If you get a raise, you must have read your Bible faithfully. If your child gets sick, hmm, he, she, uh, or your spouse must have done something terrible. If Hurricane Katrina comes by, hmm, Long Beach must have been sending their socks off. In this, Jesus' disciples sounded a bit like Job's friends when they assumed that calamity befell Job because of his sin. But that was Satan's doing with the permission of God. So let's go back and, and remember the Job story. Remember now, who ever perished being innocent? Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. The world is not a mathematical function where if you put in a certain value, you always get a corresponding value. Sometimes good actions lead to bad outcomes and vice versa. A friendly wave to a neighbor may receive a scowl. A drunk driver may get away with an accident. All brokenness and suffering is a result of the fall in Genesis. Adam and Eve's sin brought curses and death into the world, so all suffering is a result of sin in general. Certainly, there are some illnesses and suffering directly attributed to specific sins and personal choices. In Numbers 12, for example, Miriam sinned against Moses, so God struck her with leprosy. Likewise, sex outside marriage may lead to sexually transmitted, tra- sexually transmitted diseases. Jesus seems to have attributed the man at Bethesda condition to his sin. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. But as Jesus pointed out in this passage, not all suffering is attributable to someone's specific sin. The disciples asked about the specific curse of the man's blindness, but Jesus answered in terms of its purpose. This man was blind so Jesus could reveal himself as the light of the world and do the works of God in healing this man of his lifelong blindness. Jesus broke through the man's physical blindness Similarly, Jesus' light breaks through our spiritual blindness so that we may see him in faith, be, be saved from our sin, and join him in the work that he is doing. 
Jesus repeated a statement that he made in a previous chapter. He is the light of the world. This statement can feel quaint or sentimental to us, but it would have been vivid for the disciples listening. Now, here in 2020, all we got to do is flip a switch and we have light anywhere that we are. Even our smartphones function as flashlights. But during Jesus' time, there was no modern lighting. So once the sun set, you were in the dark. All work had to be done while there was still light outside. Jesus was saying that he is the source of light that pushes back the darkness and lets us see so that we too can do the works of God. The same God who spoke forth light to begin the creation process in Genesis 1 has shown forth the light of Jesus to make new creations. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, God has done this so that we might become the light of the world, reflecting the light of Jesus. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus tells us exactly what it means to shine light, to do good deeds in his name. When we do good works that reflect who Jesus is, God gets the glory. This means that the way we parent our children, our speech and conduct while we work, and the way that we care for and elevate the powerless ought to be done in such a way that the world sees it and is pointed to Christ. Our light shines when we live as redeemed sons and daughters of God. So that brings us to point two of this week's lesson. Jesus came to do the works of God. The formerly blind man's neighbors were astounded that he could now see. So they took him to the Pharisees who questioned him about his healing. Now, when he attributed his healing again, once again on the Sabbath, to Jesus, they interrogated the man's parents to verify if he were really blind before. The Pharisees didn't want to believe that this man had been healed because they refused to acknowledge Jesus' significance and power. So, so let's let's back up and and see what's what's going on with the man's parents. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? This is he. Others said, He is like him. I am he. How were your eyes opened? A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Where is he? I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, What do you say about him, because he opened your eyes? He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of him who had received his sight, and he asked them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? 
We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So they again called the man who was blind. Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him. You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. Why? This is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. According to the man who was formerly blind, no one had ever heard of anyone restoring sight to someone born blind. In fact, there's no story in the Old Testament of the blind receiving sight aside from Elisha's enemies in Second Kings. But that was a special case. Elisha's enemies were struck blind by God at Elijah's request so that they wouldn't capture him. Then after Elisha led them into his king's presence, he prayed again that the Lord, that God would open their eyes and, and God did. So this case of blindness wasn't a case of disease or disability. Elisha didn't do the blinding or the giving of sight. Elisha's, Elisha prayed and God did the miracles. This healing of the man in our story is unique because Jesus is unique. Jesus does what no other man could do, and he does what only God can do. Throughout the Bible, the act of giving sight to the blind is something only God is capable of. Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Giving sight to the blind was also a sign of the age to come when God would restore all things. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and will hold your hand. I will keep you, and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. One more. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. History is full of remarkable men and women who did fantastic feats and greatly impacted the world. But Jesus is unique because he isn't just any man. Jesus is the Son of Man, the Savior who has come into the world fully God and fully man. The Pharisees said that they didn't know where Jesus was from. They wanted to belittle him as if he weren't important enough to know things about. But the healed man claimed they should be able to tell that Jesus is from God because of what he had done. It wasn't the mud or the pool of Siloam that opened the man's eyes. It was Jesus. And if Jesus did that, it was because God did it through him. He reasoned that healing comes from, from God, so Jesus must be from God. How ironic that this unlearned man who had been blind had to teach the Pharisees on good theology. Jesus does the works of God because Jesus is from God, and if this is true, then Jesus' works show us what God cares about. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. What did Jesus do? Just in this narrative, Jesus corrected a misunderstanding, taught the truth, healed the blind, been befriended the marginalized, and confronted the proud. All these things show God's love for us, but they also reveal God's plan to push back the darkness and undo the brokenness in the world and restore creation. The greatness of Jesus' works was in his death and resurrection by which he secured forgiveness of sins and a restored relationship with God for those who believe in him. Jesus lived a sinless life, bore the punishment for our sin in his death, and conquered the grave in his resurrection. Jesus did what no one else could ever do, save us and restore us to the Father. The promise of salvation and restoration is available to anyone who will believe and trust in him. The work of the gospel also grants the believers a mission and a purpose. Because of what Christ has done to reconcile us to the Father, we are now called as his agents of reconciliation to do his work on the earth, looking forward to the day when he will make all things new. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that brings us to the final point of this week's lesson, which is Jesus came to confront spiritual blindness. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. 
Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words. Are we blind also? If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore your sin remains. The Pharisees responded to the man's testimony by throwing him out of the synagogue. So Jesus went out and looked for him. You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Now that he was cut off from all spiritual connection to his family and people, what would he do? Would the man blame the man who had healed him? No, 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 no. In fact, upon learning that the man was the son of man, the promised Messiah, the former blind man responded with faith and with worship. This was the work of God in his heart. This man went from describing Jesus as a mere man to calling him a prophet to saying that Jesus must be from God. But his confession here was altogether different. He called Jesus Lord and worshipped him as Lord. Uh, Lord in that day was a pol polite way of addressing a man similar to sir or mister would be today, um, which is how the man used the word in verse 36. But Lord also was used to refer to the God of the scriptures, Yahweh. And in verse 38, the man referred to Jesus as divine, as shown by his willingness to worship the Son of Man in the flesh. He didn't come to this belief on his own, but by the work of God in his heart through the Holy Spirit. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. The man who couldn't see anything earlier that day now saw Jesus, and he saw Jesus for who he really is. He didn't just receive physical sight. This man received spiritual sight. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the man confessed with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and he worshipped him. This is precisely what happens to every Christian at the moment of conversion. Unlike the man who had been healed of his physical blindness, the Pharisees were spiritually blind. They made confident yet woefully wrong assertions that Jesus was not the Messiah. They rejected the true light of the world and thereby confirmed that they were in spiritual darkness. Jesus told us why. They thought that they were without sin. They thought that they could see, so they remain enslaved to sin. Imagine this miracle story if Jesus had come to the blind man stumbling along, bumping into every wall and tripping over every rock and asked if he wanted to see. But the blind man said, mm, what do you mean? I can see. This, this was the condition of the Pharisees who were blind to their own blindness. Since they thought that they could see spiritually, they refused to come to Jesus and believe. And so they continued to be enslaved to their sin. Their prideful sin prevented them from seeing Jesus as the light of the world. Sometimes we can act just like the Pharisees, but we can avoid making the same mistakes as these leaders by embracing a humble, teachable posture. How do you respond when someone points out sin in your life? Thankful or defensive? Unless we acknowledge our need, we'll be blind to God's provision. So in closing, the vast majority of people on this planet can see, and we often take that for granted. We go through this life rarely, if ever, questioning what it would be like to live blind. We're used to seeing ourselves in the mirror, being able to drive ourselves places, and appreciating the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. 
Likewise, believers may take for granted the gift of spiritual sight made possible by Jesus' death and resurrection for us. We've seen the glory and beauty of Jesus by faith and lived in his light, but the world still lives in spiritual darkness. We've been blessed by hearing the gospel to see Jesus. Will we share that same gospel with others so they too can believe and see Jesus for the first time? All right, y'all, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we have a lot of folks that are hurting out there, and we got a lot of folks that are blind out there. They might not be physically blind, but Father, you know that they are spiritually blind. Dear Father, open their eyes to let them know that you are the true light of the world and that none of us can see, none of us can enjoy being with you for eternity if we do not bow before your throne and admit that you are Lord. You are Lord of our lives. Dear Father, even the rocks would cry out. Dear Father, let us let us humble ourselves. We love you, Father. And dear Father, let us be the salt. In your name we ask. Amen. Y'all have a good week. Uh, I hope to see y'all soon.